what is the object of trauma? I was asking in preparation for this presentation. How can we find an object that incarnates the very notion of trauma, I ask myself, rather than illustrate or narrate one of the historical cases? Which ideal models of trauma do we unconsciously employ when we discuss the trauma of the technosphere? Is trauma represented by a body, an object, an event, an infrastructure, or rather always by a broken object, an amputated body, a partial process? Is not trauma always a becoming, a, a healing process, whose nature is indeed that of being both a fragment of a previous unity and a fragment of a future one yet to be constructed? One of the best ways to objectify trauma in neurology is to take the example of an amputated limb and to see what is the cognitive effect of that physical amputation. The missing limb belongs to the canon of visual arts since Middle Ages, with Saint Cosman and Damien even playing the trick, like in a South Park episode, of implanting the leg of a dead black man into the body of a still-living white European. The legend goes that the so-called patient here wakes up with the leg of another skin color, great allegory of today's Europe, we could say. A better example of the cognitive dimension of trauma is the phantom limb. The phantom limb is a neurological case in which a person still feels the presence of a hand, arm or leg after its amputation. Furthermore, this person still suffers the pain associated to that limb, what is called neuropathic pain. The phantom limb is a vivid example of what I'm trying to represent, that is a profound tension between flesh and mind, an ontological clash between the abstract and the concrete that permeates the definition of trauma. The artist Alexa Wright has worked with neurologists and patients to reconstruct in fictional photographs the exact spatial position in which patients were feeling the missing limb. This, this is patient RD from her series After Image. The neuroscientist Ramachandran has published a famous book on this topic, Phantoms in the Brain, that is precisely addressing the cognitive dissonance between the nerves that feel the present hand and the eyes that see the missing hand. Ramachandran conceived a simple therapy, the mirror box. The mirror image of the right hand here produced the illusion of the presence of the left hand. The simple trick can fool the brain's perception of the body. It intervenes at the level of the cognitive mapping of the body that is produced via our eyes, and in some cases it can alleviate the neurological distress. Phantom limbs do have, in few cases, abnormal dimensions. This picture is a drawing by Robert and Suzanne Mays of the apparent field of sensation around the physical left hand of patient MG. The fingers extend in the outside space, far from the amputated hand. This is called mind lib, more precisely, as the brain projects far beyond the previous coordinates of the missing limb. This hand projection looks indeed abnormal. It is, however, the projection of a brain trying to desperately fill in the void and conquer the environment around. The brain appears desperately to project the previous constellation of its body, what is called the body image. The same may be happening with our memories, when after a trauma we keep on projecting them around us in a distorted way. It is this abnormal abstraction projected by the brain that represents for me the best way to introduce the alien hand and the work by Kurt Goldstein on trauma. Specifically to stress that trauma extends into the space of abstraction more than what we think. A more uncanny syndrome that we can bring to discuss trauma is then the alien hand. The alien hand syndrome was first described by the German-Jewish neurologist Kurt Goldstein in 1908. In this syndrome, after a brain injury or in the case of a disease like Alzheimer, one hand starts to move independently like it has a wheel of its own, sometimes in conflict with the other hand. In the first clinical case registered by Goldstein, the alien hand was trying to strangle the neck of a 57-year-old woman while she was sleeping. In another instance, the right hand was bottoming up a shirt while the left hand happened to undo at the same time the same buttons. You probably remind uh, Dr. Strangelove by Kubrick and the way he was fighting against his own hand and trying to hide its Nazi drives. The alien hand is another important case of cognitive dissonance. Patients describe often this phenomenon as having their hand possessed by a spirit or a demon. In comparison to the phantom limb, here is given a different and complementary case. If in the previous 
in the previous case, we still have the feeling of a limb that is no longer present. Here we have the presence of a limb that we don't feel part of our body anymore, that actually has developed a mind of its own. Where in the case of the phantom limb, the body appears as a gestalt unity that has lost a component, yet still projects that unity, that cognitive map around itself. In the second case, the body is still one unity, yet it has developed two different gestalten of itself, two body images. Interestingly, for both the neurologist and the patient, the alien hand appears like it is developing a mind in its own. As Gashvind acknowledged, Goldstein was perhaps the first to stress the non-entity of personality in patients with trauma of the corpus callosum, the big conurbation of nerves connecting the right and the left brain hemispheres. Goldstein is renowned for having developed holistic and organismic theory of the brain, but he also showed with the alien hand case that our mind is separable in autonomous circuitries, circuitries that appear to reorganize themselves after a trauma and provoke not just cognitive dissonance, but the split of cognition itself. Goldstein's description of the alien hand was one of the first accounts to recognize that the brain produced a dynamic cognitive map of the body that is continuously and unconsciously readjusted. What Metzinger, Metzinger has more recently expanded in the idea of phenomenal self-model. Goldstein was an influential figure of the 20th century. He left a crucial mark on French philosophy as much as American cybernetics, and usually it's not very well remembered this. We should remind it with a short biography here. Uh, Goldstein was born in Poland, uh, Katowice at the time. He became the head of the neurology department at Berlin Moabit Hospital after studying the brain injuries of World War I soldiers in Frankfurt. Being of Jewish lineage and also a member of SPD, Goldstein was arrested and tortured by the Nazis in 1933 and released only by the intervention of, of a psychoanalyst that was in contact with Goering, yet with a strict order to leave Germany forever. In 1934, in Amsterdam, he dictated his seminal book, Der Aufbau des Organismus, almost nonstop, over a period of five weeks, leaving himself and his typist in a state of prostration, reminds Oliver Sacks in his introduction to the English translation. In 1935, supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, he arrived in New York, where he died in September 1965 after working in prominent universities, such as Columbia and Harvard. The Aufbau des Organismus was not a book of philosophy, but is probably the neurology text that had the greatest impact on the philosophy and technology of the 20th century. As Anne Harrington reminded once, the story of Goldstein was a true Weimar story, something to rediscover a long century after his birth and exactly 50 years after his death in New York. Why Goldstein is so important in discussing trauma? Goldstein is to be remembered for having developed a positive definition of psychic catastrophe and trauma. For Goldstein, the brain is always in a state of active trauma. Before clarifying this, it's important to add a few other things. First, that for Goldstein, both abnormal and normal behavior are the expression of the brain's antagonism with the environment. The abnormal state is an expression of the adaptation as much as the normal state. Any symptom, good or bad, is a sign of adaptation of a positive endeavor. This intuition will have an incredible influence on French philosophy and the way, for instance, Kang and Foucault will define the abnormal. When we get sick, our symptoms are the attempt of the organism to find a new equilibrium. The real sick organism, according to Goldstein, is the one that doesn't deviate from the norm, that cannot invent new norms. Indeed, second, the antagonism with the environment, the struggle for adaptation, always go through the invention of new equilibria, new habits, new norms and categories. Adaptation happens via the, pro via the production of new abstractions. Symbolic forms, cultural forms, knowledge and science are necessary to come in turn with the world. Goss and Hegel's here also the work, of course, of his cause in Hans Kassir. How is trauma affecting the abstract behavior? Let's see an example from Goldstein. He had a patient with brain injury that could not repeat a sentence like, the snow is black. He would agree only to repeat, the snow is white. This was not the refusal to lie or to joke. It was the inability to suspend the rules of common sense just for a second, just for a test. The brain trauma produces here the incapacity to abstract from the concrete behavior of the everyday life. The power of abstraction was for Goldstein the power, I quote, to detach our ego from the outer world or inner experience, to plan something in the future, to construct hierarchies of value, to perform symbolically. 
Indeed, what is the best symptom of a trauma for Goldstein? Not necessarily a disordered behavior, but for instance, an excessive attention to order. Goldstein was studying World War I soldiers arriving back from the front with severe brain injuries. You notice that some of them were keeping the hospital rooms perfectly in order. Every day, within the space of their rooms, they were cleaning and sorting things in a maniacal way. A sudden change in the disposition of objects or an event like an unexpected visitor could provoke discomfort and pain. The patients were not able to tolerate the minimal degree of disorder in their own world. Order was a symptom of trauma. Galston made the following hypothesis. The brain traumas were precisely affecting the patient's ability of abstraction. It is the ability to recognize abstract shape despite their context, and also the ability to live in a space of a chaotic disposition of objects and people. Goldstein thought, Goldstein thought that spatial order was not necessary. Object orders and function can be mentally reconstructed and manipulated without intervening in their physical disposition. For this purpose, he introduced a clinical test to be performed with common objects that were supposed to be sorted according to their shape and function. Goldstein was working on the idea of brain plasticity already 100 years ago. The brain, for him, was always in a continuous process of self-actualization. And after a trauma, in the case of brain trauma or body trauma, keeps the, the, body, the brain keeps on inventing new norms, new behaviors, also in an unexpected way. Goldstein's model can be helpful to frame both the phantom hand and the alien hand. In the phantom limb case, the brain didn't update the abstraction used to perceive and control the body. The phantom limb is indeed a map looking for a territory that is no longer there. In this attempt, the brain can project new abnormal maps, like in the case of this abnormally expanded perception of the hand. Conversely, in the case of the alien hand, the territory is still there, but the, but the map got split in two parts. As Andrew Pickering has shown in his book, The Cybernetic Brain, the early cybernetics was inspired by an adaptive model of the brain. Early cybernetics happened, happened in fact, to be deeply influenced by biology and neurology, as much as information theory. David Bates from Berkeley University, moreover, has stressed the role of error, abnormality, and catastrophe in the design of cybernetic systems. He reminds that, quote, Cyberneticists were intensely interested in pathological breakdowns. In his 1948 classic, Cybernetics, Norbert Wiener claimed that certain psychological instabilities had rather precise technical analogs. Pathological processes are not unknown in the case of mechanical or electrical computing machines. Bates then traces Goldstein's idea of weak catastrophe to demonstrate that, in fact, the theorists of the cybernetic era were in interested in machines that could show properties of self-repairing after a catastrophic or traumatic accident. Today, we can exemplify this very easily if you look at artificial intelligence and neural networks, the term machine that learn by error and by a sort of network of, networks of self-organized micro-catastrophes designed within the system. Artificial intelligence has already absorbed the idea of optimal brain damage, that is the trick to improve the computational power of neural networks, just weakening the strength and number of their connections. If you think of neural networks and artificial intelligence systems that run by error, by breaking up, this is a strange nemesis for Deleuze and Guattari's idea of desiring machines, the famous machines of the productive unconscious, those machines that continually break down as they run, and in fact run only when they are not functioning properly, as the famous quote goes. How much disability of self-repair and of learning by error can be registered in today's notion of the technosphere? What strikes me is the parallel between French philosophy and Anglo-American cybernetics. With French philosophy obsessed by the history and the liberation of madness, mental illness, sexual abnormality, and schizophrenia, and American cybernetics obsessed with future machines and the way to incarnate, incarnate reason into an artificial mind. Looking attentively, the two lineages share a common root in the positive definition of trauma and catastrophe. We are today trying to define the trauma of the technosphere, but to do so, it is important to detect which model of trauma and catastrophe we apply to humans and which model of catastrophe we find historically inscribed in the, in the ontology of the technosphere. 
However, how Goldstein noticed in the case of the brain, the point is not just to respond to a trauma, but to take advantage of a trauma in order to invent a new equilibrium of the organism. This is a very advanced definition of neuroplasticity, that is the ability not just to recover from a trauma and restore a previous state of equilibrium, but the ability to invent a new state thanks to the traumatic event. Phantom limbs and alien hands can be detected also in the technosphere. We have had that feeling of disorientation and distress for not being able to access email. When we are cut off from our digital extension, we feel the pain of a diminished organism. We know this very well. Try to focus for a second on the reaction of your brain to that feeling. Focus on how the brain tries to rewire with something different that is around where your usual devices are not available. We could also think the technosphere from the point of view of the alien hand. Indeed, the experiments about extended mind by Chalmers and Clark already have shown how we always think with external tools, how we think even through the architectural space that we inhabit. The extreme case of the alien hand model applied to the technosphere would be the nightmare, for instance, about the potential autonomy of artificial intelligence, about intelligent machines that decide to disrupt communication networks and stock markets, the nightmare about weaponized robots to get autonomous from our will and kill us. But we are already thinking and perceiving through artificial intelligence. Take the example of the alien landscape produced by Google Deep Dreaming. It imitates the mechanism of our perception and brings them to another dimension. A cognitive dissonance is continuously produced in our relation with these intelligence technologies. The technosphere is not just a physical metabolism. It is the extension of our cognitive adaptation to the world, often following a colonial drive, of course. The technosphere has been described as an extension of our mind, as a noosphere, as a world brain, also as a pathosphere, as it was said this morning. But we could describe it as an extension of our adaptive traumas too. The technosphere, but more precisely the noosphere, the sphere of the conscious and unconscious knowledge and perception, is the extension of our pre-traumatic predictors and also of our pro-traumatic adapters that simulate and multiply state of traumas in order to adapt better to this world. The Anthropocene paradigm could be, for instance, one of these pro-traumatic adapters. A question as a conclusion. Do we have a positive paradigm of trauma at the same level and scale of the age of intelligent machines? How much are we suffering? The last part missing. <laughs> <laughs> this is after the missing limb, the missing paper. This is the last, the last page, incredible. Huh? Phantom page. Does anybody have my phantom page? Oh, this is the nice Nemesis. Uh, sorry. Do you want to know the conclusion? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I was said. Um, do we have like a paradigm of um, trauma that is abreast of the. Ah, thank you. <laughs> this is a nice. <coughs> A missing page, all them. Yeah. It was a missing letter. That I okay. So, do we have a paradigm of um, trauma? Um, I mean, for ready for the age of artificial intelligence. Um, in the final talk at the last Anthropocene campus a year ago, Jurgen Rehn argued that even if nuclear power is removed as a source of energy, the knowledge about nuclear energy needs to be maintained. There is a diagram inspired by Rene Tom that is about the mathematical prediction of a political crisis in relation to nuclear power. It's about the politics around the nuclear power. It is a topological model that Tom admitted was inspired by the catastrophe model of Goldstein. I admit it needs a bit of explanation and a bit of mathematics. This scheme is just an attempt of cognitive mapping of the alien end of the technosphere before it may strangle us. Thank you. <laughs>